Greetings, hope you are having a good day. We now turn to the page that is titled Governments and Economics. And you can follow along. I'm going to kind of read your notes, but then I'm going to add several things to them. Uh, many political commentators have discussed the close linkage between politics and, and economics. And sometimes this gets associated uh, with, with only liberals. But I don't think this linkage has any political philosophy at all. I think that conservative, uh, moderate, or radical commentators have all discussed this linkage. Uh, once again, I turn to my dear friend, Aristotle, who uh, once again is the first prominent political philosopher to make uh, an economic link between well-governed city-states and the level of economic development. And I actually think that Aristotle has some wise words for us. Uh, I think that this is true uh, for society today. In fact, I believe it is even more true today than when Aristotle was writing. So Aristotle claimed that the best governed city-states had large middle classes. And this is actually one of the fears that I have of the United States today. We have the greatest income and wealth inequality in the advanced industrial world. I think that government policy has created a situation uh, where there is a thin crust uh, in the upper class that is continuing to do much, much better and a lower class that is getting larger. And in fact, I mentioned earlier that an eighth uh, of Americans uh, live in poverty. Uh, at one time, not too long ago, when I was a young child, for example, the average American CEO made about 30 times the salary of their average worker. Today, it's about 475 to one. And, and so the point is, and uh, this is one of my pet peeves, is that you know, people who want greater equity, you know, are communists or socialists. No, not necessarily. I, I think that you could be a conservative and could make the argument that having greater income uh, and, and wealth equality could create uh, more social order, more stability, less crime, and a variety of things that conservatives embrace. So I actually think... Uh, you know, I don't think the United States was any more socialist or communist when I was young. I think we were just as capitalistic. I just think that government policy was one that encouraged uh, greater equity than today. Getting back to Aristotle, uh, Aristotle made the claim that a too powerful upper class will ignore the basic needs of the citizenry and concentrate on enhancing their own self-interest. And certainly, I believe we saw that uh, with the last uh, round of uh, so-called tax cuts uh, in the United States. One of the first things that President Trump did uh, when that legislation was signed is he went to a group of very wealthy people and said, I made all of you uh, a lot wealthier today. And uh, that tax cut was sold as a lower class tax cut, and I believe 83% of the benefits went to the top 1%. So uh, I'm wary uh, of, uh, of, of a country that continues to foster greater and greater inequality for both conservative and liberal reasons. I think that, that, the, that the liberal in me wants greater equality, and I think the, greater, uh, the conservative in me wants uh, greater social order, and I actually think that having greater equity will feed both the conservative and liberal tendencies uh, that are in me. Uh, he also points out that large lower classes uh, are often easily swayed by demagogues who can get their obedience. And once again, you know, not to pick on President Trump, but I'm going to do it today. Uh, you know, he he made a speech in which, you know, uh, he he said, "I love the uneducated." And if you take a look uh, at, at his voting base, they tend to be, uh, you know, a lot of them are lower income and, and, and not particularly educated. And certainly I think that Donald Trump uh, fits the notion of a demagogue. Now, again, whether you 
like his policies or not is different, but certainly he makes that appeal. Uh, the United Nations about a decade ago made the claim that $8,000, and I believe I've mentioned this before, but this is where it actually belongs, uh, about $8,000 in gross domestic product per capita. In other words, an average income of $8,000 per person is the prerequisite for a stable democracy. And this is largely true. Uh, but uh, the most populous democracy in the world is quite the exception, India. So uh, whether it's 8,000, and certainly if I ask an exam question, I think I'll say the United Nations has claimed that there's an economic prerequisite at what income level uh, do we tend to see the beginnings of stable democracy? It may not be worded exactly that way, but uh, a question like that, uh, look for the answer $8,000. Now, again, whether that's increased to 9,000 or 10,000, the exact number really isn't what is significant. What is significant is that there is this belief that uh, democracy, and especially stable democracies, kind of have an economic prerequisite. And again, uh, you know, we, the United States, one of the uh, policies that the United States has tried to pursue is the promotion of democracy. And I think that that's a noble goal. I certainly think that democracies are preferable to authoritarian regimes. Uh, but the problem is, is that if the country does not have an economic floor of development, there is no way uh, that that country is going to be able to foster democracy uh, in the long term. And so uh, this, this linkage will come back to economics, especially when we talk about policy. Now, I told you at the start of this mini lecture that I do not believe that this this, this assumption that economics drive politics is necessarily something that belongs to either conservative or radical commentators. In your notes, I noted that many commentators believe that class is society's most important political cleavage or division. Now, in your textbook, Roskin has an interesting case study of Karl Marx. Uh, a radical who wrote not only the Communist Manifesto, but also Das Kapital. And, and certainly Karl Marx and people who profess to be Marxist uh, make this claim. Uh, they are economic determinists. They do believe that the most important division uh, politically in society is economic. But what is often not discussed in a lot of textbooks is that conservatives embrace the same notion. Uh, for example, the father of our Constitution, James Madison, uh, a conservative, uh, was one of the writers of the Federalist Papers. Uh, and in Fed 10 in particular, he, he talked about how the, the major division in society has been those with and without property. In other words, uh, social class. So both Karl Marx, a radical who we, we label a communist, and, and James Madison, the father of a very conservative American constitution, both made this similar claim uh, of economic determinists. And so uh, there is no question that class is a primary, now whether it is the most important, uh, but I don't think anybody would argue it's not important. And certainly when we get into our discussion of countries, we're going to see that class uh, has uh, uh, an effect on voting patterns, for example. It's not the only one, uh, but certainly uh, it, it is one. Uh, and certainly in European societies, uh, class voting is even more important than in the United States. So I turn to the bottom of this page uh, where it is just uh, titled class. And uh, as I have written, uh, class is a person's relative position within the social and economic structure of a society. And there are two elements to it, and I think they are equally important. Uh, objective means uh, the actual differences. So if we had uh, one person making a uh, $100,000 a year and another person making $20,000 a year, objectively, they would be uh, in different 
social classes. Subjective is a little bit different. Uh, subjective is the psychological component of class. Uh, it has nothing to do with objective reality. Uh, I'll give you uh, an example uh, of this. Uh, the first time, you, you guys, I told you my background, I grew up relatively poor. Uh, the first time that I was subjected to wealth, I was in graduate school. One of my students at Davis had transferred to Berkeley, had stayed in contact with me, said that they were having a party. He teased me saying that you always wanted to see what an upper class party was like. He said, we're not really upper class, we're just middle class people, but there will be some wealthy people there. Would you like to come up for the weekend? And of course, this was uh, up in the Piedmont Hills uh, uh, above Oakland. It was uh, a very wealthy neighborhood. At the time I was driving my, uh, my low rider, my 1969 Chevy Impala low rider. I, drove from Oakland, started to go up the hill in Piedmont, and immediately a police car followed me all the way until I got to the house. When I got out, my 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 former student and his dad were working out in the yard. They were playing around with the garden, so the officer kind of looked and kept driving. And So I won't go into all of the details. If you want to know more of the details, you can certainly come to it to an office hour, but one of the things that was quite interesting was at that dinner party, these people started talking about how the government, the government was screwing us middle-class people. And I got kind of interested in this because like, oh, okay. So I went to listen and one of the guys said that, you know, I heard that uh, my student's dad, uh, you know, he goes, I, I hear he's on tough times that you know he's he's only making five hundred dollars an hour and if if i could only make five hundred dollars an hour i'd just retire it wouldn't be worth my time to work for five hundred dollars an hour now at the time i was a teaching assistant at uc davis and my total income was eight hundred dollars a month so you can imagine uh, what i was thinking about this guy saying that five hundred dollars an hour isn't even worth working right and he was then went on to say, and it's because the rich people are screwing us middle class people. And this guy who was talking then patted me on the shoulder and said, right, rich, uh, us middle class people. And I'm thinking to myself, I just nodded and kind of laughed and thought, uh, you have an odd definition uh, of middle class people. And he went on to say how bad the government was getting to where he had a horrible year last year. He barely made a million dollars that a few years before he made nearly $5 million. And it's because of the government and they're screwing us middle-class people. So uh, subjective is psychological. It's, it, it's how you perceive yourself. Now, what's interesting is that in the United States, again, there's greater income and wealth inequality than any other advanced industrial society uh, in the world. And yet subjectively, many Americans, in fact, there are lower class people who consider themselves to be middle class. And there are a lot of wealthy people who think of themselves as just normal, average middle class people. On the other hand, in Britain, there's a greater perception of class differences. They speak with different accents. They, uh, uh, upper class people tends to be kind of a snob culture. We'll talk about this later. So it's really, really intriguing. Objective and subjective differences in class are very different. So in America, when we talk about class, we stress these objective features, that is how much difference is there in income and wealth, et cetera. Uh, but in Britain, there's subjective elements. Did, did, uh, did they go to a private school uh, or public school? Um, do uh, do they have a certain accent or not? And so there's a whole variety of things that distinguishes British subjective class distinctions. Now I'm going to at the in the next lecture talk about the tail end of this. To get a full picture, you shouldn't just look at class by itself. You should look at other factors. I'll talk about that in other features 
in the next mini lecture. Have a wonderful day.